Let's continue with our second session. Um, we have uh, the speaker, Peter Klepetz, who is a research advisor uh, at the Institute of Philosophy of the Research Center. Peter works at the intersection of uh, contemporary continental philosophy, German idealism, psychoanalysis, and many other um, sub-themes. Uh, here he published articles uh, on these themes uh, in various journals, including Filozofsky Vesnik, Problemi, and uh, a lot of uh, foreign uh, reviews and journals. Um, he's the author of uh, three books, am I right? The Emergence of the Subject is the first one, the second one, uh, it's Profitable Passions, published in 2008 by uh, Society for Theoretical Psychoanalysis, as well as um, the third one, who came out in 2019, uh, and the title is Matrixes of Subjection. Uh, Peter's today's talk has the title About the Obscene and Cruel Master. Thank you, Christian. Uh, actually, what I'm going to talk about is quite asymmetrical. I won't talk much about the masters. Uh, I will talk a little about the obscenity and the obscene, and I will finish with the cruelty. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, I gave a talk on ridiculous masters last year in San Carlo Dome by the event masters uh, organized by the Association of Hebung, so I don't I don't see the, the point of repeating stuff here. And I will give one or two remarks concerning the obscenity and, and, and then I'll go to cruelty. So, uh, I think we are now dealing with new uh, breed of masters in politics. And I also think that their main characteristic is that they say and do things that are shockingly outrageous, bizarre, obscene, from the perspective of modern democratic and cultural standards. The next new thing is that they are everywhere now, and most importantly, these new masters came to power through democratic elections, so they have certain legitimacy. Uh, they are somehow linked with the, the rise of the obscenity and cruel talk, but they are not responsible for it. They are just using it uh, in a way. We are living in, I don't know how to, to put it, times of uh, harshness or rudeness, as Renata Salietzel did it uh, with her latest book, times of neoliberalism, catastrophe, you know it all. So, uh, so my main point is that the arrival of the new masters is somehow simultaneous with uh, shifts regarding the tolerance towards obscenity and uh, cruelty, but I also uh, am trying to claim that they are not the only cause for that and they are not solely responsible for that. They are just adeptly exploiting the changes in the public and communal spheres. So what is obscenity and what is obscene? The usual definitions are quite, uh, quite worry, and uh, they are as follows. Obscene describes something that is morally, morally offensive, repulsive, or abhorrent in a sexual way. So, obscene acts are acts that portray sex in a very frank way, that some people find vulgar and lewd. Obscene jokes are considered taboo in polite society. So, obscenity is somehow linked to the excessive and the offensive. Obscene is something this is, that, that is offensively rude or shocking to some people, to someone. So however we look upon things, obscenity is in the eye of the beholder. So, and uh, legal definitions and prohibitions try to protect those most vulnerable in, in this way. I won't go into details, but th this is the situations from the 18th till 19th century in common law, etc., etc. And uh, the definition is always used is the following. 
the tendency to deprave and corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences and into whose hands a publication of this sort may fall. That's, that's the definition and they try in, in legislative way, they try to follow it in a way. In uh, one of my books, uh, Bustian mentions Profitable Passions, Capitalism and Perversion 1. I was devoted also to, uh, a chapter was devoted to pornography. And there I used very apt definition of Linda Williams, a researcher in the field of pornography. Williams uh, uses the play of words, obscene and unseen. And she claims that what was before on the fringe, on the margin of stage, somehow with the pornification of the society comes into the main stage, is now public in front of everyone, etc. I think this is very, I think personally this is very apt definition, but in my opinion it doesn't suffice because it's not able to uh, somehow uh, interpret recent changes. Recent changes where everything is put on display, nothing shocks anymore, and to make things work, the emperor himself likes to tell us that he's naked. So that's, that's the situation we are now. However, this uh, definition of Williams also cannot explain the reverse process. The reverse process, as you know, in, in, in recent infamous events, uh, when in the US, a Florida school principal resigned after students at a Christian charter school in Tallahassee were shown Michelangelo's statue of the biblical figure of David. So uh, one parent complained that the children had been exposed to pornography and that, that shocked everybody in the world. Uh, for reasons that are di diametrically opposed to the common perception of obscenity. How on earth is possible to see this statue as obscene while centuries have gone and this is the well-known work of art? So, uh, I think that we should somehow uh, put in front two things which, are, which, are, which matter in our context. First, that obscenity is somehow a stake and flag in various social struggles, where the idea of what is obscene and what not changes literally from day to day, from place to place, from case to case. And in the final analysis, there's always a certain boundary, certain limit, certain threshold uh, that uh, should not be uh, crossed, and this the playing with this threshold is also uh, special, important for our new masters. They play a significant role here because uh, in, in these cases they, just, they are just uh, divisive and polarizing uh, as well. Their powerful weapon is the use of the obscene, scandalous, offensive, and violent language. And they deliberately utter inappropriate and scandalous statements, statements that no one else would dare to make public, statements that are full of vulgarities, obscenities, and bizarreness. Even more, because they know they, they cannot publish these things in uh, public media or ordinary media, they publish those things in, their, in the social media, and uh, somehow, the, the uh, reactions come, become the front news on the so-called mainstream media. And in this way, the circle is closed. The public is shocked. And whether this is a preconceived calculation or not, it has its effects. It attracts attention. Bad publicity is better than non, none at all. And it creates impression of someone who fearlessly and uncompromisingly breaks the booth and the rule of cultural, political, national, global elites. So the main weapon of these uh, new masters is to trigger somehow strong emotions and effects that are divisive. They try to divide and to set the house on fire. But later, they, the main pyromaniacs 
perversely pretend to be the only true firefighters and peacemakers. And that's, that's the objective here. So to put things somehow into public space and to push limits in that way that uh, struggles became some sort of a paravan for what they are doing, actually. However, if we uh, look more closely into some of these cases, we can see that they are not just openly vulgar or profane and uh, obscene. Let's take the very well-known example related to Donald Trump, who, who else, uh, whose sexism and misogyny uh, is very well known. Uh, and this case concerns the tape that was leaked in October 2016. And it was originally recorded in 2005. On it, Trump said, you know I'm automatically attracted to beautiful, I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet, just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you are a star, they let you do it. You can do anything, grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. You know very well that after that followed a huge public discussion and that Trump somehow tried to, to uh, he didn't actually sincerely apologize in a way, in, at least in my view, but he tried just to put in front some other things. What's the main point here? The main point, at least in my view, that uh, not only that the words Trump used to apologize were insignificant, actually he didn't regret it. And uh, what he regretted most was that someone was able to exploit these words politically. And uh, this, this is the, the main point. And the other point is that on this tape, he somehow not fully aware that these uh, statements of his might someday be broadcasted nationwide. He's saying it in a little intimate uh, circle in a way. Still, they are harsh words and uh, shocking, but the, my point here is that although Trump pretends that he can say and do all, he has to be careful. He cannot be openly too vulgar in a way. Why is this important? This is important exactly what concerns cruelty. And now I can just go more slowly. Even Trump must never appear to advocate cruelty or that his actions are cruel, even if they are. Cruelty is a world thing. The world is cruel. Others are cruel, and that's crucial for Trump. He always emphasizes it, that the world is a vicious and brutal place. In that way, see, he somehow justifies his social Darwinism, his highly competitive and militaristic view of society, where there is constant egoism, battle, conflict, and war. I, I will just give you some examples of his statements. Accept it, the world is a brutal place. I love to crush the other side and take the benefits. Why? Because there's nothing greater. For me, it is even better than sex, and I love sex. When somebody screws you, screw them back in spades. These are all somehow Trump's uh, statements. And in them, as uh, Christian Fuchs, in one of his book about uh, Trump as a digital demagogue, claims using such descriptions, Trump certainly gives a realist picture of capitalism and neoliberalism. That's true. However, and uh, I think that by referring cruelty and implying that the world itself, not us, is cruel, Trump is just following the leading or, or dominating ideology regarding cruelty. Cruelty, namely, is not held in high esteem today, if it ever was. The good society, whether it calls itself enlightened, democratic, developed, progressive, or modern, is not cruel in any sense. 
It is not surprising, therefore, that one of the prevailing views of cruelty is that there should be less and less cruelty as humanity develops. And this is spontaneously understood as something that concerns only the actions of psychopaths, brutes, tyrants, and extremists, but not us, civilized, cultured, or educated people. So, civilization and culture against each other, against cruelty. That's, in short, what needs to be said. However, things are not so straightforward, and they do not go so smoothly. There are many conundrums, and we should mention quite a few. First, cruelty has always been part of human history, but there are only few scholarly works that deal with it in depth. Philosophy first mention it here and there, but usually only in passing. There are perhaps several reasons for this. The first is undoubtedly related to the fact that the very definition of cruelty is elusive. The second, that we prefer to see cruelty elsewhere than in our environment, our society, or in ourselves. The third, that we associate cruelty with barbarism and bestiality. Spontaneously, it is assumed that cruelty is present in the more primitive forms of society, while it is less and less pre present, presented in civilized society. In reality, this is not the case. In fact, cruelty is omnipresent in our modern civilization. It is part of our daily lives, whether we admit it or not. It is strongly denied, and perhaps we should say it is disavowed, but it is part of our modern life, uh, everyday life. On the other hand, the flip side of the denial and disavowal of cruelty is, paradoxically, extreme fascination with it. This fascination ranges for the spectacular scenes of state violence of modernity, recall the very beginning of Foucault's work, uh, Discipline and Punish. Again, there's fascination with war, destruction, catastrophe, fascination with serial killers a la Hannibal Lecter. The villains par excellence recall fascination with Hitler figure. Even Trump is called sometimes Twitler. And there, there's also fascination with radical evil as well. And if we live in a society of, uh, uh, of spectacle, we cannot uh, mention the sport. Sport is cruel. We all know, we all say for, uh, for tennis players, for cyclists, whatever, that they are modern gladiators. Why? Because only one wins, other are losers. And that's cruelty par excellence. If we uh, take a closer look, we can see that there are problems with cruelty with the definition of it. Uh, there's a question of subjectivity and objectivity. Is cruelty something that is determined by the one who is subject to it? Is cruelty in the eyes of the beholder? Is cruelty something relative, not only subjective, but also culturally determined? Or it is absolute? Is cruelty a radical evil? Is it even possible to give a universal definition of cruelty? Then there's also a question of distance towards cruelty, to distance from it, to deny it, to repress it, to disavow it, in terms that somehow cruelty is there, it is objective, it is part of the system, it is part of capitalism, etc. Cruelty is somehow scary, uncanny, and fascinating. We do not want to know about it, we do not want to deal with it, but we cannot get rid of it easily. For Lacan, cruelty, and here he refers to Balthazar Gratian, is something that is undoubtedly surpasses the animal for man's ferocity toward his semblable exceeds everything animals are capable of. I cannot go into the details how different philosophers defined cruelty from Nietzsche, Walter Benjamin, Saad, uh, Montaigne, etc., etc. Here, uh, there's only one book I would recommend in this regard, and this is, it comes from the pen of Giorgio Baruchello, Philosophy of Cruelty. It's very informative and uh, 
somehow gives you the impression how, what to do with cruelty. I'm talking for roughly 25 minutes. I will, in 10, 15 minutes, I will finish, okay? So, um, as I mentioned in obscenity, obscenity deals with some sort of invi invisible threshold, invisible limit, and it is the same in cruelty, however, it is somehow different. Cruelty concerns rules, laws, and statutes, but where exa exactly cruelty becomes cruel has to do with some unwritten rules. And every ideology has uh, this sort of rules, every custom, every norm, every rule. When we go beyond them, and this is crucially, but follow their spirit or their letter, we find ourselves in cruelty. So, uh, there are many tr problems with definition of cruelty, trying to pinpoint uh, the intention there, but somehow uh, it is very difficult to, to do that. Although cruelty is seen as something arbitrary, discretionary, capricious, it is not always something subjective or active. A group or a community can also be cruel. We can be cruel to ourselves, as Nietzsche never tires of repeating this. Freud will add that it is our superego that can be cruel to our own ego and to us. Just think of the cruel captain story that today we called. So, uh, systems can be cruel and also transnational communities like European Un Union can also be cruel. We call the 2015 uh, ref refugee crisis. So the trouble is that cruelty persists even though no one wants to do anything with it. And what is more, I would like to uh, emphasize that in recent times, especially with the war in Ukraine and especially with the arrival of new masters, we are uh, facing with many uh, changes and mutations towards cruelty. Since Second World War, and by the rights of the United Nations from 1948, cruelty has been defined as a criminal offense. Article 5 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights defined it as follows. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Furthermore, cruelty is increasingly being prosecuted not only against humans, but also against domestic animals and, in principle, against all living beings. This undoubtedly brings with certain problems, not only because the scope of cruelty is expanding, but also because cruelty, by definition, concerns a sort of agree area. I don't have time to, to develop it, but cruelty is somehow split into two extremes. It is, uh, it is connected with the animal or let's say uh, natural part of a human brutality. And on the other hand, it is connected with civilization. It is connected with the the high points of civilization. And if we, if, if we would follow Sade here, his, de, uh, his uh, definition of cruelty, there's male cruelty and there's female cruelty, we would find the same here. But I don't have time to develop it. So, cruelty can be sophisticated. Its violence can be cultural, civilized, and is prosecuted, as I said. I think it is important to, uh, to look more closer at the torture here, just briefly. Torture is considered by political and civilizational consensus, declaratory and legal, to be cruelty par excellence. There should be no torture at all, period. The problem is that it is carried out by those who, in principle, are obligated to prosecute it, and that is the national states. As Amnesty International regularly reports, torture is practi practiced by almost all, all countries in the world, but none of them recognize it. 
There have even been attempts, especially since the September 11, to justify torture philosophically, legally, and juridically. These attempts did not succeed. However, they have blurred the clear line between what is permissible and what is acceptable. Torture is not just about the extreme and physical abuse of the body, the loss of dignity when exposed to a murderer in a torture devices. The cruelty of torture occurs on multiple levels, as a method, as an end, as a means, and as a byproduct. Torture has to follow somehow uh, its path. It is necessary to avoid to avoid premature execution or death, which is not ruled out any in the end, and it must achieve the fine line between Verfleischung und Vernichtung, carnalization and annihilation. It must achieve its goal, whether it be betrayal, extraction of secrets, humiliation, humiliation dehumanization, subjugation, while uh, using most barbaric and most sophisticated methods, known as white torture, which leave no trace. These methods are very diverse. Human imagination is always knows no bounds when it comes to cruelty, and range from forced sleep deprivation to spatio-temporal disorientation, immobilization, isolation, sexual violence, psychological torture, mock executions, etc., etc. Although torture was clearly prohibited, over time it has morphed into something else that transcends the classical terms and leaves behind previous definition of torture. Here I rely on Donatella di Cesare, Torture, the book from 2018, published by Cambridge Polity, and I recommend reading of it. Torture as cruelty is a, a prime example of the elusiveness of cruelty. We are all declaratively against it, but much of it happens in secret. As Zizek has pointed out in the past, it is torture in the context of post-9-11 debates about torture, and the debates about torture at Abu Ghraib prison in 2004. That is exemplary of, I'm quoting, where the main dangers really lie in the unknown known things, the unknowledged beliefs, assumptions, and obscene practices of which we pretend to know nothing, even as they form the background of our public values. That is why the US military leadership's assurance after the Abu Ghraib affair that there were no d direct orders to humiliate and torture prisoners is ridiculous. Of course not, because as anyone familiar with military life knows, such things are not done that way. There are no formal orders, nothing is put in writing, only unofficial pressure, hints, and intimations given in a private. That's how you participate in a dirty secret. So I will try to present in five minutes what is uh, coming with these new masters. And that is that they are somehow not longer hiding cruelty, but pointing it out openly. Recall the Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, who said in 2016, Hitler massacred three, three million Jews. Now there's three million drug addicts. I'd be happy to slaughter them. And as uh, later, uh, was uh, documented. There was about 6,000 deaths that nobody was accounted for, according to Amnesty International. Second, I would recall uh, here in Slovenia, we have frequent talk about the details of after the Second World War, uh, post-war killings of, uh, of uh, collaborators, Nazi collaborators, etc. And sometimes one gets the feeling that uh, talking publicly about all these details, showing all these bones and, and skulls, etc., is just to somehow prepare us for that cruelty is uh, somehow allowed in a way. And that's how it, this justifies recent uh, Janša's thesis about how the civil war is starting now again. But the, the champion in this regard is probably Serbian President Vucic. Now in Serbia they had this uh, 
massacre done by the three, 13 years old uh, schoolboy, and they talk a, a lot about it. But last uh, autumn, there was a lot of uh, talk on public TV, etc., about uh, their fight with mafia. There were very uh, there were there were there were a couple of arrests of the mafia, led by Velia Nevolia, Velia the Trouble, originally Velko Belivuk, the, the White Wolf, and as often happens in Serbia, uh, the Velia Nevolia built his career from the leader of football hooligans to the head of a mafia clan. The latter was known for his brutality and cruelty, but also for his alleged links to the highest Serbian authorities and to Vucic personally. In order to refute these rumors, I would suppose, and to vilify the mafiosi, President Vucic gave several long lectures on the public TV that were more like monologues in which he outlined unprecedented atrocities of this clan. Members of this mafia clan killed people, cut off their tongues, play football with their severe heads, process them into meat, into specialities like cevapcici, and Vucic backed this up, this story, with a series of very uh, graphic photographs. So, uh, somehow, with doing this, he is moving the threshold up and up and up, not just, uh, not just uh, preparing his uh, adversaries and uh, opposition that the fight might be really uh, cruel, in a way, fight between him, of course, and them. Just uh, let me, some final remark on the war of the U Ukraine, which was exactly at one year ago, frequently described by European leaders, by Pope Francis, etc., as a unimaginable cruelty. So, Ukrainian war is cruel. What really strikes us is that both sides, even Russia, agrees that somehow cruelty is heinous crime, which uh, in August when the daughter of the ultra-nationalist Russian philosopher Alexander Dugin, Daria Dugina, was called, President Putin in a public statement a few days later described this act as a heinous, cruel crime. So both sides agree somehow that cruelty is heinous, and somehow they are both aware that every war is cruel. Every war is cruel because the Russian side, as you, as you know, insisted for a very long time that this is just a special military operation. So, the cruelty of the war is not just these imaginary corpses, uh, destroyed buildings, etc., but the fact that the war affects the lives of many people in an indelible and irreversible way. I'll skip the, the, um, the, the part where I deal with the, the Arto and the, the, the way how cruelty opens our, our eyes. And I will also skip the definition. And uh, as, I, as I insisted, we have always, we always deal with some kind of a doubling of cruelty. You know? And this is obvious if we take a closer look at how Geneva Convention defines war crimes. Uh, I don't have time to develop this, but uh, they try to prevent atrocity, atrocities which are defined as unnecessary. And they somehow uh, put a division into cruelty, uh, cruelty which is unnecessary, and cruelty which is, as a part of every war, is somehow unavoidable. So, um, in a way, cruelty is not only redoubled, but concerns the excess as such. The excess which is, as Zizek in his latest book uh, points out, the true regulating power of the law does not reside in the direct prohibitions, in the division of our acts into permitted and prohibited, but in regulating the very violations of pro prohibitions. The whole point of law is to regulate its violations. Without violations, there would be no need for the law. 
The point of cruelty is what? What is the most cruel thing we can do here? Uh, as Elaine Scarry in her work, The Body in Pain, showed, the worst thing you can do to someone is not sadistically to torture and brutalize them, but to bring down what psychoanalysis calls fantasy, the story they are telling about themselves. So the, the final aim of the cruelty is that a person cannot be reconstitu reco reconstituted, cannot put himself back together again. The greatest cruelty then consists in bringing down a per person's fantasy in such a way as to destroy the story he has made up about himself. And as we Lacanians tend to say, the cruelty aims in something more than you. I love you, but because inexplicably I love you in something more than you, the object you are, I mutilate you. So that's the point of how, as Bradley would say with Clausewitz, uh, cruelty somehow attacks the enemy's Schwerpunkt. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Questions? Thanks, Peter. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic paper. Um, just a very simple question. Can you have violence without cruelty. You know. Can you have violence without cruelty? Yeah, meaning, Yes, of course you can. You have a yeah. doctor with a scalpel, you know, this is violence, but it's not cruel. Say again? The, the doctor with the scalpel. This is... Okay, but I mean, for example, can you have, can you inflict the death penalty without cruelty? Can you fight a war without cruelty? Sorry, I didn't understand you. Can you inflict the death penalty without cruelty? You know, under American law, the doctrine of the abolition of cruel and unusual punishment did not lead to the abolition of the, of the death penalty. Um, the Geneva Convention has not led yet to the abolition of acts of violence and war. What, I, what I'm getting at, I guess, is what, what's ultimately more cruel? Is it the master, the obscene master like Trump, who exhibits and glories and enjoys his own cruelty? Or is it the obscene master like Barack Obama, who really thinks that maybe, yes, you can fight a hygienic war using drones and targeted killings and so on, uh, who thinks that you can abolish cruelty but still kill endlessly. You know, Obama, as we all know, Obama massively accelerated the, the drones program in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and places like that. I mean, what's ultimately more cruel? Is it the abolition of cruelty? Could that be the, the cruelest gesture of them all, the belief that you can do away with cruelty in war? Yes, I get, I get your point. Thank you. I, I, I agree with that. And I, I cannot choose. <laughs> they are, as a Stalinist, I would say they're both bad. But in a way, uh, I see Obama's choice more dangerous in a way. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I liked the, the, especially the, the last part of the, the definition that you quoted at the end because I think, to me, I start, when I think about what, what to me is the most cruel, like constellation, is the one where um, it has nothing to do with actions but only with the, with the feeling that, it, that the other produces. So about not only of my impotence, but also of my... Uh, of, of, like, <laughs> The most cruel thing is that the, the one who makes you feel stupid that you actually want to kind of uh, act against this master or, or something like that. So uh, there is, uh, in this way I understand that there is no positive definition of cruelty because it, it always depends on the context. I mean, on the context, how do you produce this effect? So uh, th that, that the, the, the cruelty would only be like inscribed within a, a context in, in for instance, when you say uh, uh, the European Union is in a way really cruel, but not because it's it, it, like it, not when it acts cruel in this uh, in this sense, but when you have this feeling that you can that you cannot oppose it at all because it's it's kind of blocked uh, every you know every way every critique is opposed. Uh, I wouldn't say that that Trump is a very cruel subject. 
because I think he's, he goes like a, a step further. I mean, he's, he's only like the, the obscene subject that kind of enjoys this uh, cruelty, I mean, the effects of, 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 of impotence, or, or at least he enjoyed the, the effects of the impotence of his, of his opposition, right? Uh, inside the Republican Party uh, in the first place. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 there is one other, uh, yeah, because, uh, and you mentioned this Slovenian situation, for instance, uh, the the most cruel thing about this, you know, showing off of, of the of those all those bones and and you know, is that it produces the, it, there is a, some some kind of victimization in, included, of course, in this uh, uh, in in all this, you know, culture of Marxism, uh, the talk about the culture of death, that that the other, you know, is uh, kind of. Uh, Kind of producing and uh, acting with, so the so you always you know you always feel kind of impotent and also you kind of feel wrong whenever you oppose it, you know. But in a, in some objective sense, you know that you are that you were you would be actually right to you know to critique all this. But there is no kind of words. There was no you know all this this context is kind of filled. It's it's kind of stuffed that you don't have any any uh, place to operate within. So I think this is a I would say that this is a the the point of every you know cru of of cruelty. Yeah. Thank you today. I'll, I'll, Sorry, there, there are many. There are many uh, just just quickly to uh, uh, thank you for many these uh, insightful remarks. Uh, uh, yes, I I spared you completely uh, our Slovenian case because uh, I, I, I didn't talk about... Um, I think that uh, many uh, Jansha, Grimms, etc., they enjoy, enjoy in inflicting pain in the way they are discussing uh, with their adversaries and opposition, in a way. Um, and in terms of ranging cruelty, I do agree that Trump, com in comparing with that, is, he's just, this is this how the world functions. He doesn't seek this point where a remark, insult, or something uh, like that becomes painful. Whereas in a Slovenian case, we have constantly this, and this is the same as in Nazism, uh, where, uh, where Hitler describes where for the first time in Vienna he, he encountered the Jew, the, you know, and he fell in love, uh, not with these words, but exactly the same uh, case we have here in Slovenia. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and one last thing, sorry. Um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't use this. Uh, Russian language offers us a very nice description about truth because there are two words for truth, istina and prada. And this was used by Stalinism and also by some other philosophers, but let's leave it. Istina is somehow concerns the factual, the factual state of things, uh, while prada always implies a position of authority, whether history, national interests, uh, whatever. So you, you are always right because the big other, to, to speak in Lacanese, gives you, uh, uh, authorizes you in a way. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, this is very ironical because uh, <coughs> the, the greatest anti-communists are still communists in, I mean, Stalinists, uh, that one would try to find. I think we... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, there... <laughs> no, because we, we really ran out of uh, time. Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, it's okay. Um, and I'm sure there will be a lot of remarks, comments, etc., etc. I would have uh, at least uh, three more, but um, let's uh, thank Peter once again.